Turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. If you haven't had to find this before, you can go to the first page of the New Testament, then flip back eight books. That gets you to the beginning of Jonah. There are some good plot twists in chapter 3. Uh, the ones who ought to be rebellious end up repenting, kind of stunning repentance, actually, that verges on devotion. And the one who ought to prove faithful and submit sort of does, but not really. Um, if you're a journaler, I'd like you to write some, uh, a question up on the top of your page. Um, and I'm just going to give it to you, so write quick. Um, where does my personal response to God's call fit inside the mix of obedience, devotion, repentance, and submission? Where does my response to God's call fit in the mix of, uh, inside the mix of obedience, devotion, repentance, and submission? And spoiler alert, I'll give you a clue. Jesus wants your heart. Jesus wants your heart. So let's take a minute to remember the story of Jonah. A prophet in the Old Testament times, in the first sentence of his story, he is introduced to us as Jonah, son of Amittai. His name literally means dove, son of faithfulness, which sounds lovely, doesn't it? But it's funny because Jonah was neither dove-like nor faithful. <laughs> but this Jonah is asked by God to give a message to the people of the great city of Nineveh. God calls this city great, but to an Israelite, it was anything but Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and in Jonah's day, the Assyrians were the bullies of the Middle East, one of the most brutal societies in history, actually. And we know some brutal societies. So, so by all accounts, they were evil. And this is who Jonah, an Israelite, is sent to warn. So you can kind of understand his response, which was to run. He, he ran because he didn't like these people. Jonah, dove, son of righteousness would rather die than serve people God wants to save. And he gets so angry with God when God looks on with mercy on people who irritate the stew out of him. And so he runs because no Israelite in their right mind wants to be anywhere near these people who burn and loot and kill. So he takes the first cruise ship in the opposite direction. And, but, but running, it turns out, is not the right answer. Jonah thinks he is running for his life, but actually he's running from it. Let me say that again. Jonah thinks he is running for his life, but actually he's running from it. I wonder if that sounds familiar in anybody, to anybody in the room today. <laughs> we got some hands raised here. This is good. So to stop Jonah from his own foolishness, God sends a storm that tosses him over the side of a boat. And then, at God's command, a large fish swallows him whole. And there, in the belly of that fish, cocooned by God, God deals with a core issue in Jonah's life. Jonah has become attached to his opinion about people God loves. Let me say that again. Jonah has become attached to his opinion about people God loves. In fact, he has become attached to his way of dealing with his feelings about people God loves. And he has become more attached to those opinions and feelings than he is to God. Does this sound familiar to anyone in the room? This is the, this is the wrestling that sends him into the deep where he discovers that he has idols in his life. He has prejudices and he likes his prejudices. He has things he'd rather think and believe that had nothing to do with God. And there in the belly of that fish, he discovers that he has not been swallowed by a fish, but by God. And there in that deep place of searching, he shows us that it is in the swallowing, when God swallows us, when we get to see ourselves as we actually are. And it is in the swallowing that we get to see God as he actually is. And it is in the swallowing that we get relational eyesight to see those we thought were the worst of the worst as people God came to save. Jonah gets it even if unwillingly, that by clinging to his preferred opinions and feelings, he has not just canceled the Ninevites, he has canceled God. And he will learn 
that those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Brilliant verse. Brilliant. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And this is still true. Anything less than God, any agenda or habit or prejudice or self-serving ambition turns the cross of Christ into a folktale because it forfeits the grace that could be ours and it makes the whole story of Jesus into a moral lesson while it leaves us to our idols, unprotected, unredeemed, because idols don't care a thing about your protection or your redemption. At the end of his ordeal and after his revelation in the depths of the ocean, Jonah is spit out onto a beach, sort of repenting, doing the thing God called him to. But even then, the jury is out on just how sold he is on this task he's been given. And that's where we are when we begin chapter 3. There is Jonah sprawled out on the ground, whale spit all over him. Wondering what to do next. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I want you to stop just right there and just look back at the first verse of of the whole book. Chapter 1 verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So now we're over at chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. They're almost identical. Isn't that interesting? So God, as it turns out, can be very patient, but he's also very consistent. (laughs) He's just waiting. He's just drumming his fingers and waiting for Jonah to get it. But his word doesn't change. His position toward the Ninevites doesn't change. He's not compromised in any way. So verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Underline those two words, Jonah obeyed. And in the margin of your Bible, write, right there around verses 1 through 3, obedience announced. Jonah obeyed. The Hebrew word for obedience means to hear, as in Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's the beginning of the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So that's when the Bible, hearing and obedience are the same thing. You haven't heard until you've obeyed. The Greek word, which is the, what the New Testament uh, would, would bring it down to, goes a little further in its definition. It means to hear and listen with submission. Or to trust, or I love this one, to pay attention. To pay attention. We all know what it's like to hear what someone said but not be paying attention to it. Do not look at your spouse right now. We all know what that's like. I like the idea of obedience as paying attention to where God is already at work so we can join us. Uh, so sorry, so, I, so we can join him. So we can join him. It makes me think about how dogs see a kitchen floor. You know what I mean? Like when I see a kitchen floor, I mean the kitchen floor for me is just, even if I'm thinking about it at all, it's just a floor. It's how I get from point A to point B. The floor holds me up while I go from the refrigerator to the stove. But that's not how a dog sees the kitchen floor. When a dog sees the kitchen floor, Oh my goodness, it's a plate. It is one big plate, like a big formica plate, especially when food is being prepared or consumed. A dog sees this great big plate full of opportunity for finding and eating things that have fallen like manna from heaven. That's the nature of sanctified obedience. It isn't just an action that gets us from point A to point B. It is a feast of opportunity, a constant desire to look for where God is at work so we can do what God is doing. And here's the thing. We don't actually know which kind of obedience Jonah is acting out of, although we have our suspicions because Jonah is so much like us. Sometimes we get to obedience without completely letting go of rebellion. Come on, y'all. 
It's just people you know. That's right. They call that passive aggression. When our internals and our externals don't exactly match up, when we have an internal no but an external yes, and sometimes that's okay. Sometimes it's better to fake it till you make it than not to try at all. John Wesley went very unwillingly, according to his journal, to a Bible study on Aldersgate Street. But by the end of that night, his heart was set on fire and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't always have to feel it to step into obedience. But listen, full-hearted obedience takes us places that half-hearted obedience cannot take us. It takes us into the heart of God. 1 John 5, 3 says, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and what? Carrying out his commands. In fact, John says, this is love for God to keep his commands. In other words, there is an intractable connection between obedience and love. Authentic obedience to the call of God will lead us, John says, to love God and then to love the children of God. So does your brand of obedience lead you into love? I started reading a book this weekend by Arnold Lott. It's called Brave Ship, Brave Men. It's, it's a, it's, the book is a story of a World War II ship called the Aaron Ward. There were actually three Aaron Wards. This is the third Aaron Ward. And it was specifically, the book is specifically about the 48 hours that the Aaron Ward, a, a mine crafter, was, uh, um, was patrolling off the coast of Okinawa in 1945, in those 48 hours, those two days that they were patrolling, they took six kamikaze hits. They should have been destroyed. And the whole story is about how the crew survived by functioning as a single unit led by a captain who had their utmost devotion. So the author talks about the difference between obedience and devotion. He says, by Navy regulations, the captain commands the obedience of his crew. By virtue of his office, he ensures their respect. But all the regulations and decorations on a uniform cannot enforce a sailor's devotion. This, each officer in command must earn on his own. And listen to this. He says, the difference between obedience and devotion may be slight to a landlubber, but it is there, and a sailor can underline it subtly by emphasizing either the first or the last words of, aye, aye, sir. The difference between obedience and devotion is which word you emphasize. Do you hear how brilliant that is? So what is the difference between, aye, aye, sir, and, aye, aye, sir? What's the difference? What's that? You hear, yeah, you hear, yeah. You've heard what they've asked you to do. You see, you see the reason behind what they've asked you to do. There's a devotion. Whatever you say, sir, yes. The answer is yes. Do you hear yourself in that difference? The times when you've emphasized the authority of the other rather than the devotion within yourself? So this connection between love and obedience is critical to understanding the nature of wholehearted devotion, which is where all sanctification takes us. Listen, sanctification, being made holy because God is holy, is, doesn't want to take us only to the door of obedience. It wants, us to, it wants to take us all the way through obedience into the heart of God which is exactly what Jesus means when he says, John 15, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Right there, Jesus is talking about the kind of obedience that expands our emotional health and deepens our emotional connection. And Jesus wants that for us because our emotions, listen to me, I know I'm getting a little bit deep here, but this is good. Our emotions are connected to our ethics. Jesus wants your heart because your heart is connected to your ethics. And Jesus wants your ethics to be his ethics. 
Scott McKnight says, emotional conditions shape what we believe are right or, and wrong. So empathy and compassion are emotions that strengthen our ethics, that deepen our obedience, and that allow us to channel the love of God for those he so desperately wants, not to destroy, but to save. So God will tell Jonah before this story ends, when Jonah's back to sulking because he didn't really want to see these people saved, God will say, why shouldn't I care about the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 souls and also many animals? God's word to Jonah is a statement of deep compassion for people. And listen, it is a picture of what God's judgment looks like. His judgment is not condemnation. It is compassion. And that is what we absorb when we allow our obedience to develop into devotion. Not just right action, but right heart. So let me say it again. Jesus wants your heart. Look at verse 3 again. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, <clears throat> from the least of them to the greatest, put on sackcloth. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is obedience illustrated. So write that in your in the margin of your Bible next to verses three through five. Obedience illustrated. Jonah might not be feeling all the compassion in the world for these people, but he does what God asks. And there's a lot to notice here. First, I want you to notice how little air there is between Jonah's proclamation and Nineveh's repentance. It happens immediately. This had to be the easiest prophetic gig, gig ever. And notice how little Jonah puts into it. Jonah hardly gets a third of the way into his project before his message has gone viral. And his message is tiny. It's just five words in Hebrew, eight in English, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Which I'm guessing he did not tell people with the greatest voice or tone of compassion in the world. <laughs> He doesn't even tell us how Nineveh will be overthrown or that there's an option, probably because Jonah doesn't really want an option. He'd prefer that this statement be a matter of fact, not option. Forty days and you guys are toast, overthrown. Don't let the back door hit you. So the, Nona, no, the Ninevites have to interpret this. Is this a statement of fact or is this an open door? And y'all, this is so cool. The Hebrew word that is translated as overturned can sometimes be translated as deliverance. How cool is that? Sometimes in the Bible, this word is used to talk about being overturned, and sometimes it's used to talk about that being the subject overturning itself. So the word is full of possibility. And the people who get this prophetic warning from Jonah choose to hear it just like that, as an open door. They choose to believe not that this is a curse spoken over them, but it's an invitation to choose. They can be overthrown or they can be delivered. They can be conquered by their depravity or they can conquer it. So what do they do? They choose to believe God for the power to change, and that becomes a moment for Jonah. Now he has to decide if he will be conquered by his own prejudices and angers, or if he himself will repent all the way through into the heart of God and God's beautiful, deep emotion toward people. Will Jonah believe God for the power to change both the Ninevites and him? Schadenfreude, do you know that term? I've talked about this before, but it's been a while. It's a, it's a German word. Schadenfreude is a German word for that experience. And I'm, I'm, this is actually a quote from the dictionary. You can see it on the screen. Of, of pleasure, joy, or self-satisfaction that comes from learning or witnessing the troubles, failures, or humiliation of another. There isn't really an English equivalent to this word, but we definitely get it, right? <laughs> we get it. <laughs> I have a friend 
I texted him last night. He lives in Mississippi, and so just as the game started last night, for those of you who are not Georgia fans, Georgia played Ole Miss last night, and I texted him after the Ole Miss team made their first uh, touchdown and said, okay, we're in it now. Your team's looking decent. And he texted back, and he said, oh, I'm not an Ole Miss fan. I'm the opposite of an Ole Miss fan tonight. I'm a Georgia fan. He's, it turns out he's a Mississippi State fan. And he said, if Ole Miss was playing the Taliban, I'd wear a turban. <laughs> That's what it means <laughs> to want the worst for another person. It's, it's feeling that sick pleasure when we find out someone we don't like or someone with whom, whom we disagree is wrong or worse, that they're suffering. Jonah's whole story could be reduced to that one word, schadenfreude. His problem with God's call was that Nineveh might get saved, might not get destroyed. And Jonah could suspect that of God because Jonah knew God. He knew that God's brand of judgment is rooted not in condemnation, but in compassion. You should write that down. God's judgment is rooted not in condemnation, but in compassion. And what Jonah learned about God and what the Ninevites believed about him now becomes a moment for us. Do we believe God for the power to change people? Are there people we secretly believe are beyond the reach of God's grace or we wish they were? What if the people you, you, you think are the most lost are actually much closer than you think to spiritual awakening? And how do you respond to that idea? David Brooks says this, A good person inconveniences himself for the sake of community. A bad person inconveniences the community for the sake of himself. We know which one of those Jonah was. I mean, he was ready to let a whole community of people die rather than Share the word with them from God. So which are you? What is the inconvenience waiting for your response so that your community is built and not harmed? Here's what happened next with the, in, with the Ninevites. Look at verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, notice that Jonah didn't tell the king of Nineveh. The word had gone viral. And the king of Nineveh, I mean, I was like getting something that you said all the way to the president of the United States. We'd like that occasionally, wouldn't we? <laughs> but we also know how hard that is. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. You know what I hear when I hear that? I hear Romans chapter 8, all creation groans. He wants all of creation to groan. Let everyone call urgently on God. Underline that word urgently and let them give up on their evil ways and their violence. Underline that word violence. It means he actually was able to see what it was that he was doing. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. That's repentance announced. So write that in the margin of your Bible between verses 6 and 9. Repentance announced. The king, who never even talked to Jonah, got, a wor got word and immediately covered himself in sackcloth and sat in the dust. That's a sign of repentance. And then he immediately called the whole city to, to repent. And their act of faith was immediate. Contrast that with Jonah's response who was slow and rebellious and refusing to go and angry. Here's what I know. Resentment eats obedience for breakfast. You ought to write that down. Resentment eats obedience for breakfast. 
Resentment turns obedience into a have to, and it awakens all our rebellious tendencies. It makes us emphasize the last word, not the first. Aye, aye, sir. You're the one in charge. There's a story Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 21 about two sons. If you want to put a finger in Jonah chapter 3 and flip over to Matthew chapter 21, Jesus says, he's talking to the religious leaders, and he says, there was a man who had two sons. This is verse 28. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, the son answered. But later, he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John, and he's talking again, remember, to religious leaders, to religious people, For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, and the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So Jesus is talking when he tells this story to religious people who probably thought they followed the law better than most and who probably thought their obedience was commendable. But then when God's heart stretched toward prostitutes who needed forgiveness and toward diseased people who needed healing, their hearts didn't stretch that far. And when those same prostitutes and diseased people came to believe in Jesus as Messiah, Well, which of those two kinds of people did what his father wanted? The reluctant religious or the grateful redeemed? This is Jonah's story. Jonah, an Israelite and a prophet, eventually obedient enough to go and do what God asked. And yet, when the Ninevites repent, we don't know if he ever got God's heart for them. Meanwhile, the Ninevites, this evil society, believed God and then demonstrated their belief by acts of repentance. Everybody ends up in sackcloth, even the animals, which seems extreme. But this is a king who had been so evil that he seems to have had the scales fall from his eyes. He can see the whole city is immersed in sin. Everything is covered in sin. People, animals, land, all of it needs to fall under the grace of God. And when God saw that they saw, he relented. Look at verse 10. When God saw, underline those three words, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. That's repentance illustrated. So write that in the margin of your uh, Bible next to verse 10. I'm moved by those three words, when God saw, when God saw. When God saw, he relented. And he didn't relent based on a promise or on some flourish of proclamation by the king. He didn't relent because of an emotional appeal. If you do this, then I promise to do that. No, God relented because the people actually changed. They turned from their evil ways. And Tim Mackey says the word for turned in this verse is shuv, S-H-U-V. That's the Hebrew word. It shows up in the Old Testament. That word, shuv, shows up in the Old Testament more than a thousand times. So pay attention. It's the Hebrew word for repent. What I really love about this word in the Hebrew is that there is a sense in it that when we turn away from our sin, we are returning to God's created design. In fact, the word first shows up in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve rebel against God. It is them turning, shoving away from their created design that that causes them also to turn away from God. But when we shove, when we turn back to God, he's there. He's there. Even in his judgment, remember? Even his judgment is not abandonment, 
but compassion. His judgment is his correction when we turn away from our created design. So God is always faithful. 2 Corinthians 2.13 says that even when we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. God cannot ghost himself. Thanks be to God. You know, ghosting is a word for what happens when a person you've been in a relationship with goes silent. One day you're enjoying dinner together. The next day is as if that person has fallen off the face of the earth. There's no conversation. There's no closing arguments. It's as if they have disappeared, and it leaves you without closure. That lack of why, that is maddening, peace-sapping. And that ghosting is now an actual word says a lot about how relationships are evolving in a hyper-connected world. We are, um, we are connected, but we are emotionally distant. I mean, it's, 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 it's old school, actually, to say that we've never been more connected and less authentically relational. But Paul tells Timothy that God is incapable of ghosting. His heart is for people, and he cannot disown himself, so he cannot disown people. No matter how wrong we've been, no matter how far from him we go, he will not leave us. If we are faithful, faithless, excuse me, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot disown himself. That's the mirror opposite of ghosting. It is the promise of eternal presence. No matter how badly I screw things up, God will not ghost me. And that is the beauty of our gospel. Even the most evil nation can return to God. Even the most sinful person can start over. Even the most resentful prophet can be swallowed by God. Not distanced, but swallowed, cocooned where God will help him to deal with his heart because, friends, Jesus wants your heart. So we come back to this question. Where does my personal response to God's call fit inside the mix of obedience, devotion, repentance, and submission? Am I resentful these days of someone or something who is is not doing what I want them to do? (laughs) Is my internal no at odds with my external yes? Am I distancing myself from the heart of God because of my resentments? Or, here's a big one, Have I become attached, more attached, to my own prejudices and angers than to the heart of God? Have I made my own character defects an idol at the expense of the character of God wanting to fill me? Do I need to repent all the way through into the heart of God and God's beautiful, deep emotion toward people. I want to ask you to stand. This is where we're going to end. It's with this invitation. What in me is resentful that needs to be repented? Where are my idols? Not, you know, not like the whale tail in the back of the room that looks very much like we've got an idol in the room. But those less sure things, those fuzzier things, where I have become more attached to my opinion of things than to people God loves, than to God's plan. I just want the Lord to deal with you. And if you need space up here to get on your knees, like the the, the Ninevite king, to, to get on your knees, to sit down in your ashes and say, Lord, Lord, I did not see what I see right now. I didn't see it. I didn't see where I was married 
to my own opinion and my feelings. So married to my opinion and my feelings that I, I had shut you out. I had pushed you away, maybe even ghosted you. God, I am so grateful that your mercies are new every morning, that I can come right now and start again. God, search me. Know my heart. See if there's things in me that I have made into idols, if there are places in my heart that have become hard, if there are things I don't, I haven't understood you, and where I haven't understood you, I have not been willing to obey you. God, help me to get honest with you and with myself so that I, so that I, Lord, can show compassion, not judgment toward a lost and hurting world. I don't want to be, to be the kind of person who inconveniences the rest of the world so that my stuff can get taken care of. God, give me a grace to be inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel. And God, if you would do that, we would be so grateful. You're invited to come and pray. If you'd like someone to pray with you, I'll be so pleased to pray with you. I'll be over here at the side. If you'd like to just come and get on your knees here, you're welcome. You can make your chair into an altar as we continue to worship.